as our wives, as our mothers, as our sisters in the house of the Lord. All right. Tonight, by the grace of God, I will be speaking on the subjects just very close to the theme of the month, which is God is on my side. Psalm 118 verse 6, I've been given the theme on God's right side. I'd like you to open your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32. I want to read verse 26. Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of the Levites gathered themselves together to him. Father, in the name that is above every other name, Jesus the Christ, we give you glory, we give you honor. Because your word says the entrance of your word giveth light and giveth understanding to the simple. Lord, we ask that tonight you open our hearts and do that surgery which you, only you can do in the name of Jesus. Amen. We believe you to do much more than what we even expect. We ask that at the end of tonight, you will set us on the journey, the very journey that will put us in reaching the goal that you intended for us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I said I was going to be talking on God's right side. Exodus 32. If you read, you're familiar with that scripture so well, as Bible scholars, you realize that the story is talking about the children of Israel when they got to a point and Moses went up the hill to meet with God. And um, he delayed for a while. And before you could say Jack Robinson, they had deviated from them and they started worshiping something else. And the Lord said to Moses, go down, see the people, they have, their heart has been corrupted. That was what the Lord was saying to them. So I'm going to be, tonight, by the grace of God, I'm going to be amplifying what um, our resident pastor did on Sunday. And you know, interestingly, the gospel has two faces. The gospel has the power face, which we experienced on Sunday. And tonight is wisdom for living. And the gospel has the wisdom face. I'm trusting God tonight that he will unveil the wisdom behind what was taught on Sunday. And you'll be able to apply them to your lives and begin to make much more progress in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let me quickly give you a recap of what you heard on Sunday. You see, it is that humans are tripartites. What do I mean by the word tripartites? It means that we are tripartite creatures. We are three in one, just like a type. Not saying that we are like God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. Just a type to explain it because our philosophy trying to make it logical for us to receive it. So we have a body, we have a spirit, and we have a what? A soul. Interestingly, if you read the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, everything is explained there. But let me just show you the little bit of um, how everything is got in there. Your body was written from the earth. At least you knew that, and God took the mouth of that, and you came forth from there. But your spirit came from the breath of God, and it breathed into the man. Now, where the problem is now is in your soul. That was what made the deviation for the children of Israel at that point. Because when God was telling them they were corrupt already, where did the corruption come from? It was in their soul. I will show you from here now. It was their heart that was now shifted away from the side of God to something else. And you know one of the rules that God gave them after that was like what? You shall love the Lord thy God. With what? With all? Oh, not just us. With your spirit, your soul, and your body. Because our God is a jealous God. So we're going to be seeing what really happened. 
what plays out? Because interestingly, I found that, that even as believers, sometimes we deviate from the side of the Lord. I, I've given my life to Christ. But then what happens? Why do I deviate? Why do I find it as a struggle? And I deviate from the house of from the presence, from the side of God. Because Moses was asking that question, who is on the Lord's side? The same question Joshua asked. Say, as for me and my house, who is on the Lord? I don't know about you. That was what he was asking there. And he was telling him, look, what is the presence on the side of the Lord? So tonight, I want to show you something that um, many people, um, many religions, the new age religion, that's what we call them in theology. We call them the new age religion. This is one aspect they hold on to and they are able to manipulate people in this dispensation. There is some form of power in it, in your soul. And I'll begin to explain right now. I said we are trapped being. If you read the book of 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it talks about your spirit, soul, and body. Genesis 1.26, when we were made in the image and the fashion and likeness of God. Genesis 5.1, same thing. Genesis 9.6. We were made in the English and in the darkness of God. I already shown you where your body came from, the dust of the earth, right? Where did your spirit come from? The dust of God. Now, let me explain to you how you got your soul. In theological parlance, it's a little bit of theology, but you will get what I'm saying right now. It is believed that it was a reaction between the dust of God and the dust. To create that hot part on your soul. Because if you go into, if we go deeply into explaining some of these things, no wonder the word was used in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. It says, As a man thinketh in his heart, the word heart there was the soul. Because that one, if we look at the Hebrew interpretation of what was there, it was nephes. It means soul. So this true state of a man is in his soul. You didn't get what I just said. The true state, that is your personality, is your soul. Me and you have the same kind of body. <laughs> yeah, we do. I have kidney, you have kidney. I have head, you have head. I have legs, you have legs. I have spirit, you have spirit. Because the spirit is from the same source. But where the problem is, is in that reaction. It's in that reaction, the soul. And thank God, Pastor Miller helped us so well. He showed us the three elements that make up the soul. Then. He mentioned what? Your emotions. He mentioned what? Your intellects. And you mentioned your what? Your will. You will get it now as we go. On. So our uh, soul is who we are. The real issue in trying to be at the right side of God is in your soul. Let me explain this. No one so was saying the spiritually minded is life. But to become conscious is what? Is death. Listen, what this is what he said in that verse. There are three, right? Body, soul, spirit. Your body is also the flesh, right? <clears throat> the middle ground is what? The soul, right? So if I told you that the contextual is in the soul, did you, did you get that? So what is the contextual being? The spirit is to control the soul or the flesh is to control the soul. So what the, spirit, the scripture is saying in Romans chapter 8 is that if your spirit controls your soul, you are spiritually minded. Because your mind is your intellect there. So sometimes we say mind. Let this mind be in you. This is saying that in the soul, let your soul begin to be like. Because that was what was lost in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. Because in many times it took place, took place in that of Eden, your soul was like a newborn baby, as brand new as your spirit. Did you get what I just said? It was as brand new as your what? Your spirit. That is why it was 
Adam was true to God directly. He was on the side of God. He could have won the two steps of God. He was coming to the garden. Because his soul, his will, his emotions, they were what? They were in align with the spirits. They were at power. So where that death that happens, that was recorded in Romans 6, but the wages of sin is death. And all I'm seeing are the of the gift of God. Where did death happen was in the soul. This is the only ground. See, these three parts in the soul, not especially in the soul, is where we carry out deliverance. Because if deliverance happens in your soul, oh God, and your spirit is now in charge of your soul, you can perceive the things that are of God. This is where the problem is for us as Christians. The soul. We are tossed by every reason. Up there. Why? Because the way the soul gets its information is through your senses. <laughs> That's one big thing they do. It's through your senses, your soul. Bottom line of what I'm saying is that you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you have a body. I've said that the component of your personality is where? In your soul. You, know, you see some people who are Christians, they are born again. It's your spirit that got born again. The spirit has been renewed. But now, what does he now say? He now says that you should what? Put away all superficialness and nothingness and take into you the engrafted word of God, which is able to save your soul. Because you gave your life to Christ, your spirit is renewed. Right, right, no problem. But the problem is in your soul. If that soul does not get, begin to progressively get salvation, Many times in the scripture, when you write salvation, you need to check it again. If the salvation that I'm referring to is the first experience of salvation of your spirit being saved, or it's the progressive work at which your soul is to continuously be saved. Your soul is not saved when you give your life to Christ. You didn't get what I just said. Your soul is not saved when you give your life to Christ. That is why you see somebody gives his life to Christ. The next minute, the worldly music is used to, is being played, and he begins to dance and he begins to sing. Why ask yourself why? Oh, he gave his life to Christ. Somebody will say, I gave my life to Christ, and yet he can still smoke and drink. Did you give what I just said? Why? That is where the problem was. The children of Israel had left the children have left Egypt. That was like giving them a to Christ. Oh, we are saying, oh, we are coming from Jesus. We are working with God now. We are inside now. In the spirit, but their soul was not renewed. No one try. Let's read the scripture. Romans 4. It's a popular scripture. Very popular. If you're there before me, you can help me because I'm used to projections. Don't mind me. Romans 4. All right. From verse 1. Let's read from verse 1. Romans 12 from verse 1. Okay, uh, I'm here. Let me just read from here. It says, Romans 12, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let me give you sacrifice. Can you burn your body? It will fail to exist. To remain on this earth, you need this flesh to remain on this earth. Immediately, you, the spirit is taken off. The next problem is the soul. Remember that that was the soul that was going to be locked in hell. <laughs> you get what I'm saying tonight. So, where the problem is that makes us deviate from God is what's in the soul. 
So I want you to get this tonight so you can able to, because we said the three things that make up the soul is your emotions, your intelligence, that's your mind, and your what? And your will. You see, that of your will, these two connecting to your will is dependent on some kind of information. And those information are gotten into your body through your senses. Interestingly, the two gates that connect to your soul directly, your eye and your ear. Because your eye and your ear is connected to your heart. If we dissect you now, we can't find your soul. But what we can use to describe the place of your soul, we cannot say it's not there. I'm trying to be very careful tonight because many times when people teach these things, they tend to deviate into psychology and all the humanistic theories. There are some form of power in it. When they preach the gospel of Jesus using this, trying to train your soul, you can train your soul. I bring my body under subjection. Is in your heart. All these things, I don't know. I mean, it's the two feet of the mind. This is, where the, this is where the challenge is. When you deviate from the side of God. That's why those who are the ones who say, whatever I say, what they're saying is, my spirit has been saved, so I cannot, I cannot miss hell. I cannot be out of hell. Mm -hmm. For God's help, your salvation of your soul is also very important as the salvation of your spirit. You can't keep living like nothing. Like nothing happened. The only thing that happened in your spirit, it didn't happen in your soul. It happened in your soul. That's what he said in First Peter 2 2. He says, As we all want to be desired, the sincere meek of the word of God, that you may be able to watch what was going to grow. It was your fault. Is it your body that will grow again? I don't know if you so much. He asked the question, Will I enter my mother's womb the second time? Amen. Very interesting. But it's a very really deep question. So immediately you give your life to Christ. You have to set your soul in motion for growth. So all this reason why we are in, in the Bible study like this, trying to understand the scripture and all that, it is for the growth of your soul. It's for the salvation of your soul. And the beauty of it is if you allow the Holy Spirit, who is now resident in your spirit, to take charge of the soul, happy yeah. are you. When you don't allow the flesh, the text to the soul, uh -uh. you know, it's like two against one. Who will win? The Lord will help us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. I've said that when we get born again, we get a new spirit. Nothing happens to our soul when we get saved. At the point, we get saved. We never want to get saved, but we need to work our salvation. <laughs> so that's why he said, working out your salvation with what? Fear and trend. Not the fear that God is not with me. No. But God is about to take me through the journey of becoming. I said that your soul is your real personality. Yes, sir. If you read Ecclesiastes 3.11, he says, eternity has been imputed in us. There is something I even heard from one of my teachers and got me thinking. He mentioned a book by Lester Sumra and it got me thinking. He said, do you know that if your soul does not develop, eternity will be a little bit hard. I was like, excuse me, what's going to happen after eternity? I thought, I can't go into that now because it is too much of abstract, but I want, to get, want you to get something sure. That you need to grow your soul little on this earth because of eternity. <laughs> Strange. Because of what? Eternity. Our soul needs to be educated to the level of our spirits. Many times people get saved and quickly conclude, I am a Christian. I say, no, they are not. 
because their souls need to get saved. Because when they look at them and call them Christians, well, because they were looking, they were acting. They saw them. They saw their thoughts. They saw their emotions. They saw the way they walk, they talk, their intellects, their interactions with people, and saw that these ones must be Christ. That means these people were spirit filled. Their spirit was in control of their soul. I said it that we need to work on getting our soul saved. We need to work on getting our soul saved. So let me quickly go into some little practicalities, because this is wisdom for living, right? So let me go into some practicalities of how we get these things done. I mentioned your emotions, your mind, and your what? Your will. And I said that they come in through our what? Senses. You know your senses. And most of the time, your sense of sight and your sense of what? Hearing. And I mentioned the heart as also the agent used to identify your what? Your soul. Where the corruption started for the children of Israel in that Exodus that we read is in their soul. I established that, right? Now, let's go into some practicalities of some things I'm going to be saying right now. How it works. Everything starts with the thoughts. Everything. In the group of the Israelites there in Exodus 32, that we read, somebody thought about it. And by the way, that's what, what I, I will show you something about thoughts. Because that's where I like Apostle Paul so much. He understood these things. And that's why he was praying that, look, we should cast down every imagination. You see, as powerful as this thing called thoughts, which is only happening in your soul. You know, sometimes we say it's in our head. <laughs> God will help us. I don't want to be in the heart. We just want to be in the soul. So, it starts in the thoughts. If you want to change the trajectory of anybody's life, change their thoughts pattern. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. If you begin to change their thought pattern, uh, you have set the person on the motion for what? For success. So everything starts with the thoughts. Your thoughts affect your feeling. You know, some. Interestingly, right now, that's one big problem we have as our own in our own generation now. The social media. Somebody can just think one bizarre thing. Who sit up there? It becomes a challenge for everybody. Something that one challenge. This one, said, excuse me. Where were these people coming from with this kind of bizarre thoughts? And you know one funny thing? Our thoughts. It's like the field that Jesus said the parable that the sower went out to sow the seed. As God is trying to sow the seed of good thoughts and great ideas, the devil too. That was what Pastor Miguel was explaining on Sunday. That the programming of the devil, he too is sending his own programming and codes into the atmosphere because these things must well, God help you if you clear the field of your own life. And you don't sow the right thoughts. What happened? Tears and what tongues will grow there. So you see somebody, listen, this is this is very, very just by the wayside. When you see somebody clean guy, was a church boy, he went to church. He never thought evil of anyone, never had any evil of anyone, never had any challenge of anyone. But thoughts were happening in their lives. I would begin to ask God, where is God? The point was that he didn't guard his heart. He allowed the enemy to come and sow tears. That's why the Bible was saying, when men slept, when men fold their hands, when men did nothing. 
Everything starts with your thoughts. Your thoughts affect your feelings. Your feelings affect your belief. Your belief affects your action. And your action will determine your results. So, what is about the soul here? The children of Israel will have set themselves free. If really they had some the people who them guilty, they took him and stormed him to death. Would they put themselves in trouble of thousands of them dying later? I will not have I've shown you from uh, when Apostle Paul was referring to that story, either in Romans or in um, First Corinthians. He was referring to that story in Exodus 26. And was saying those who died, I was telling them that they, it was just because they, their mind shifted. They stopped loving God with all their hearts and with all their minds and with all their strengths. They just deviated the beats. And that was what we call idolatry. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not buying my head. No problem. You spend more time. You give your, your thoughts to things like that. You know the funny thing now? That's the power the media even uses. This power of the thoughts. All they just need to do is begin to show you the picture, begin to show you the sound, begin to show you. See, we can also leverage it for good. And that's what we're doing tonight. One of it we're leveraging it for good. That's technology. But the same thing can be used against and have been used to change the trajectory. I'm not going to go into politics. <laughs> Something is coming to me. I say, no, no, I'm not going there. I'm not going there right now today. So when failure always starts from thoughts. I'm going into the practicality of these things now. Failure always starts from where? The thoughts. Ah, what am I saying? In education parlance, we say if anything failed, it failed in the planning stage. What does that mean? If during planning, where you are doing the strategic thinking and all the thinking process, everybody involved in the thinking process, in the planning process, considered all the possible thoughts of where it could fail, where it could be, what would needs to be done, what needs to be required, what needs to be that project will succeed. But if one person imagines that there will be failure. Even if he doesn't voice it out, that thing will fail. Okay, let me even ask you, let me even be a little bit uh, practical here. Let me ask you this. You're about to board a plane. You get to the harbor. You have boarding passport, everything. You're you about walking down and you walk into the company of um, somebody who presumes to be the pilot. Mm -hmm. Who will drive, who will navigate the plane, right? And you saw him jittering, shaking. And you're like, okay. He's shaking. Okay, and you go to him and you ask him. Um, and the person is saying, I'm the pilot. I'm going to be taking you. <laughs> what do you mean? You are not holding the plane. Is that what you mean? You are not holding that because you already know that you do something that you don't know that journey. This principle was used. This principle of your thoughts, where the scripture says, Guard your heart with all diligence, because out of it are the well springs of your life. This principle was used deeply by Herodias. John the Baptist confronted her and Herod. That what? Ah, you were not supposed to marry this person. Yeah, no, no, it's wrong. You took the wrong person. You took the wife of someone. And went on and on and on and on like that. And the woman was very angry against them. You see, I'm showing you something in the application. I'm showing you the application of what happened in the children of Israel. Where we, you may say, ah, I'm on God's side. I'm on God's side. No problem. Wait. You see where the problem comes in. So she got offended by her, by him. She was always thinking, how will I destroy this man? Oh, 
Yeah. After we had destroyed this man, oh, that became yeah. thoughts in our hearts. Consistently, that became the thoughts in our hearts. So what did she do? Sometimes she was helpless to help him, to even be able to do anything to him, because at some point, the error loved to help John the Baptist. That's what the Bible said. So what did he do? He took soldiers and said, okay, this man for me. Oh, really, I look at you, huh? This thing may not come to pass. I can't be able to destroy this wicked man. That is, I want to spoil. I want to spoil my. Uh, is it? How do they say it in the? You want to spoil my? Uh, you want to spoil show for me? Watch the uh, work of the king. That uh, I should be marrying that man that does not have anything to show. So every day she was ruminating on it. So ruminating on it was making the seed of that thought to ferment. Because if you plant a seed, the seed must go through some process. The seed must die. What will make the seed die? If the soil is right. This is also the problem where we don't achieve. We have beautiful dreams, beautiful visions about tomorrow. But we don't allow the seed go in deep down and stay there and ferment. We don't meditate on it over and over again. That's why he gave Joshua the description. This book of the Lord is not deep out of my mouth. Look at it. Whatever you think is what you will see. Scripture says, out of the abundance of the hearts, the mouth will what? With speech. So if the only thought inside your heart is negative, you will speak what? That is where the problem we find ourselves. We pray and we say we don't get answers to prayer. Because we are carrying what we call self-sabotage. Because if you are on God's side, it's anything you desire when you pray. Anything you desire. Put it in your heart. It's a little bit the seed. After itself, it will come bring up the cob. That is the seed has the power to bring to the bridge. That is the seed also the bring to the cup, also bring to the fruit. That same seed. So you can quantify what number of plants you can get out of a seed. You can only tell when you have like the mango, you know you will find one seed. But if you have a seed of the mango, can you tell how many mangoes can come out of that seed of mango? So that's why you need to guard your heart. Because it's what shifts you from the side of the Lord. You need to guide what you hear jealously. One interesting around me when you are even at sleep, just recently I started trying to slow down on that. Scripture is plain, worship is plain in my car. If it's not scripture, it's no sound. You come into my office. Why? What am I doing? I'm trying to create the environment where or what I don't give room for those negative thoughts. So my spirit is sharp. Is my spirit sharp? Is the soul? Is aligned with my spirits? I know one of the things that causes trouble for us is what we will eat, what we will drink, what we will clothe the body on. Well, you know, Jesus said it in Matthew 6, 33. He says, ah, your father knows now. That's why we're not able to pick the slightest thing if they're going to happen. Something's going to happen to somebody around you and you're not able to pick. But God will do nothing except he reveals it. So it's in your soul. Please, how many minutes do I have? So I don't go out of time. 
for 10 minutes. All right. Okay. I said that everything starts with your thoughts. So your thoughts, you must guide it with all what you have. Guide your thoughts. Guide your sights. Be deliberate. It was a verse some times ago that explained something to us. He said, look, I take my checkbook and I write the next value of amount I want to be worth in my bank account. And I stick it on the wall in my web group. When I wake up, it's the first thing I see. Well, those things, they are powerful. But how much more if it was the one of them that is in place right in front of you? Somebody that changed the territory, one of the person that changed the territory of my life was in during the 10th anniversary. We invited one of the, the five men that were invited, Reverend George Adigboe. Ah. It was the first time I was hearing him. And in split of almost 20 minutes, he has quoted about 200 and something scripture. I was like, ah, they were, where is this? Is this man looking at something? It challenged me a lot. So I started trying to, okay, ask, I started asking questions. Okay, how did he get to this point? How did he get to that point? And one day, I heard one of his sermon said, in the days when I was still in the valley of the shadow of death, meaning it was in darkness and not in limelight where people could know him, he took the time. He would, then those days, there were no devices. So what he does, he would take cassette players. He would read the Bible into cassette players. And will not put them as headphones on his head. And those ones will be playing. Sometimes it will slip off, it is still playing. <clears throat> his spirits were picking them. So, like I was saying about um, Herodias, she left that thoughts there. She didn't do anything about it, but she kept ruminating on it. Even to the extent that when she eats food, food doesn't taste right in her mouth. You know, you, have you gotten to that point where you are angry against somebody and the person decides to serve you just because they are married? You will not have that. And they serve you food and you're like, but you will not because you are what? You are angry. Your heart is not connected to the person at that point. Your emotion was in trouble. I remember sometimes ago where Pastor. Peter Jakai was telling us that don't take decision when you are happy and don't take decision when you are hungry or sad because you won't take the right decision. Don't even make commitments on this. Just make sure you are in the right frame of mind. Are you getting what I'm saying tonight? The children of Israel got wearied. If you go back to that scripture in verse 1, he said, let me read from here. It says, now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, you may be going through stuff right now. Thank you, sir. You may be going through stuff right now. You may be going through pain right now. The way you found it. Hmm, I remember the word of the Lord to someone right now. The plan may change. But the purpose does not change. <laughs> the plan may change, but the purpose does not change. That's so why I said, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. It is of good, a lot of evil. To an expected end, the end is still. The end will always justify the means. So stop putting yourself under that regret. Stop putting yourself under that thing. Uh, he has accepted you. Come with boldness to him. So let us come daily to the throne of Jesus. Let us receive help in the time of need. Maybe as I'm speaking tonight, you're already asking yourself questions. Am I truly born again? Do I really, am I really on the side of the Lord? Because you are saying that your soul is not yet, even your spirit, you are beginning to question. 
You have the golden opportunity tonight. You have the golden opportunity tonight to align yourself to the plan of God. There are only two natures. It's either you have the Adamic nature or you have the God's nature. Every person that was born had the Adamic nature. No one born as a woman has the Adamic nature. But we cannot put away this Adamic nature except we receive Jesus Christ and get the God kind of nature. That's why you see some people who say they are born again and they see struggle to stay alive. They see tell lies at will. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, excuse me. God does not behold any form of sin. So I want to encourage you tonight. If you just bow your hands with me, so I draw the curtain here and just pray that prayer soberly. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. You died and paid the price on the cross of Calvary for my sin that I will be saved. Enter into my heart. Be my Lord and personal Savior. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. If you said that prayer, I want to congratulate you. You are now having brand new spirits. You are having brand new spirits. So it's now time for you to walk your soul to the level of your spirits. Amen, amen and amen. I'll be cutting from here, so I will respect questions from those of us in here and from online. Maybe I said something that was not clear and you want clarifications. Go ahead. I'll be expecting your questions. Let me start my pen here so I can write. You have a question. All right, we have a question. Go ahead, sir. Just speak a little bit louder. Um, so um, you spoke a lot about the spirit and the soul. And you said the soul is the body and the spirit together. But you didn't really put into light what role the body itself plays. Or is the body subjugated automatically when the spirit and soul are like, like control of them? Oh, wonderful. Now, when your spirit takes control of your soul, your flesh will align. For instance, very practical example now, you want to fast. It's your body that you're trying to bring under subjection. And you're trying to light up your spirits. Where you will take that decision is in the laboratory of your heart. I call it the laboratory of your heart. That is the soul. Because that's your will. Even if the feeling of hunger comes, because your will, as when you're taking the decision, you are able to suppress it. The feeling of hunger comes in the flesh. Well, mind you, the feeling first comes with the thoughts. <laughs> and you are able to say, no, I am filled with the bread of life. And the blood of Jesus. That's why I say to myself. I am filled with the bread of life. And the blood of Jesus. Or sometimes I say, I eat the fire of Holy Ghost. And I drink the blood of Jesus. I get filled. Because my spirit is alive. At that point. It is my spirit that is now in charge. Of the ability. So my flesh has no, no reason. Than to what? Be under. But not to say that when you get to the point where you begin to abuse the body. No, 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 no. If you abuse the body, <laughs> sorry, you will be breaking laws. I didn't go into laws because I didn't want us to become mechanical. There are some laws that can be applied that you can begin to understand those laws and principles that can help you put you. I mentioned some of them passively, talking about guiding what you hear and what you see. It's just a very practical example. I, again, I was trying to buy a um, water dispenser in the house. But, and I asked myself, where would I even get the water dispenser bottles? It was until I bought the water dispenser that I started seeing that just 
Two blocks away from my house, they were selling the water dispenser. They were selling the bottles. I could refuse from there. I could do it. Why? Because I realized we're not. We don't process things first. I didn't allow them to be so that they can change my sight. As I many things we see and call problems, it's just your perception. I hope I helped you with the question. All right. Any other person with questions online we were expecting? Anyone type in? You could type them, and if you want to speak, you can unmute and speak, please. Okay, no questions right now. All right. If there are no questions, I would just like to encourage us all that next week will continue and I'll be sharing with us uh, be keeping a perfect heart. You see that I dwell more with the soul and getting your heart. So how do I now keep with a perfect heart? By the grace of God, I'll be explaining that next week and I will be expansiating using the laws. Aha, this is why I'll be using principles. I'll be showing you, because it's wisdom for living, so I need to show you nuggets. I'll be, uh, so those of us that were able to write, that'll be good, but next week, please bring your pen and your notes, because I will be going through those laws one after the other, and I'm trusting God that we will make good progress. And for also, for those of us, um, the TSA, the, uh, the Shepherds Academy, uh, this is just a doot from it. That's one of my, that's, I had to go and get one of my old needs to do this tonight. God bless you. So over to our sister for the announcements and the offering. God bless you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. God bless you so much, Pastor Ebenezer, for that wonderful word. Um, I hope we've all received the word and invitation from this evening, and we've all had to jot certain things down. So quickly, let's all let's all take this moment to, you know, give our offerings to God as we we'll pray. Father, we thank you for a wonderful day such as this. We thank you for this is the day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for the consolation of your word and your promises upon our lives. And we'll pray that as we give back, as we say thank you, that good measures pressed down and shaken together, running over be unto us as it is in heaven. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So the church account details have been put in the chat for the offering. So you can just check on the chat. You'll see the church account details, the bank name, the bank account number, and the account bank for the details. So taking on our announcements, 